Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. So again, I'd like to thank REC9, especially um, Sir Arnel for um, hosting this webinar. So um, to officially start it, I'd like to call Dr. Arnel Barrios to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, as uh, uh, Gladys noted, this is the uh, uh, webinar hosted by REC9, uh, co-chaired uh, by myself and Mei Lim of uh, the National Institute of Physics. So uh, today, uh, uh, Dr. Iris uh, Gaoran will uh, be uh, presenting their uh, work on ridge uh, penalization in high-dimensional testing. Uh, Dr. Gauran is currently a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, where she, she is working on uh, high dimensional and time series uh, analysis in investigation of uh, genetic variations that are consequential in identifying uh, neurological features of brain connectivity. So, um, Without much further ado, Iris, can you, you may take the sessions now. Thanks. Okay, Pa. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Pa, to wherever you are in the world. So, today I will be talking about um, this uh, very technical title, but I would like to paraphrase this. This work as my personal adventures in imaging genetics. So I work closely with uh, my PI, Professor Hernando Mbao, and another collaborator, Zhao Sha, from the University of California, Irvine. So this is one of the projects that I have accomplished as a postdoc at KAUST. So the topic is highly about the teaming up of genetics and imaging. So as I said, this is personal to me because I really am very curious about how genetic information can help us understand the underlying behavioral outcomes or mechanisms about specific disease. In particular, most of my researches during my PhD was um, geared towards understanding this genetic information as they relate to cancer. But eventually, as I was like seeking mentorship from Dr. Barrios, we were able to, to come up with the idea that in the near future, the one thing that we will be interested in as statistician is developing tools that can help us under, uh, understand the black box that is our brain. So in this particular um, juncture in my research journey, I decided to look into brain imaging as well. So genetics as well as imaging are both very exciting fields, but it's very difficult to actually understand how genetic changes in our um, system can help us understand our brain. Or in particular, if I do have certain genetic changes, how will that affect my brain and eventually affect my behavior? So with that said, our study, our motivation for this study is actually an imaging genetic study. And in this case, we were studying 350 healthy college students from BNU, and we collected information from them, 64 channel EEG recorded data at one kilohertz. Whereas you can see on the right panel, we were decomposing the information that we have for, for this EEG channel into the different waveforms. So we have the original signal on top and then as you can see it can be decomposed into the corresponding delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves depending of course on the signal frequencies. Using this brain imaging information we also wanted to look vis-a-vis -vis the genetic information of these subjects. In particular, five times 10 to the five or around 500,000 SNPs were measured from them, of which only 484,496 autosomal SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms were able to meet the quality thresholds. So with this, 
we can see right away that the data structure that we have, we only have very few subjects. And by few, I mean relative to the brain information that we have, as well as the genetic information that we have. So suppose our hypothesis is we're interested in asking whether the variation in the set of SNPs or the candidate SNPs that we have is associated with the brain information. So how do we answer and go about that question? But in, without even asking that particular hypothesis, we can just ask the very simple question, how do we start with the analysis if we have these types of data? So the thing is, the challenge for us is how to integrate high dimensional data together, especially if the data structure of one data is different from another source of data. So in some sense, how do we fuse them together intelligibly so that we can come up with the outcomes of the answers that we, uh, the, the questions that we are asking for. So for example, if we have genetic markers, as you can see here on the left, and we're trying to understand brain endotype features features so that we can fully um, look into the disease phenotype eventually. So for example, we're looking at MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment. And we can look at this as a binary outcome, whether someone is healthy or not, or as a spectrum of numbers, depending on say from zero to 100 as a score that some clinician would give a patient. So if we're trying to understand mild cognitive impairment, and we're just looking at image scans of the brain of the different subjects that we have, then we can actually perform the analysis already. So it begs the question, why do we even need the genetic information? So if we can just like, we're technically looking into something which is an impairment in the, in the neural system or the neurological system of the body. So why do we have to look at genetic markers? So the answer to that is the big picture of, as I mentioned earlier, this is my set of adventures while I'm doing this set of researches. And the big picture that we wanted to understand is in terms of frontotemporal uh, lobar degeneration. So in this case, what we wanted to look at is how do we, in this case, what we wanted to look is into neurodegeneration. In particular, this occurs when neurons shrink, lose connections with other cells, and eventually die. So the question that we wanted to answer is if someone already has a neurodegenerative disease, for example, Alzheimer's or dementia, how do we how do we help the family members of that person? The underlying assumption with um, the diseases that I'm particularly attracted to is that by the moment, by the time that you're able to detect these diseases, for example, cancer, as I was dealing with before, it's more or less too late because if it had manifested already several symptoms, then most likely you are at the latter stages of the disease. It's the same thing with dementia, most likely people who are detected to have neurodegenerative diseases have been showing symptoms of this particular disease, not just yesterday, but perhaps even years before the actual disease manifested. So with that particular problem, the, the solution of the scientific community right now is really to deal with the family members because perhaps it might be too late for that subject already with the neurodegenerative disease. For example, not, of course, we never wish this to happen to our elder members of the family, but if you have one who already has a neurodegenerative disease, at best, we can make the quality of their life the best possible, the optimal possible quality that they can have for the remaining days of their life. But there's still time to address people who are at risk, and those are family members. So familial FTLD or familial frontotemporal lobar degeneration occurs in roughly 30% of the cases of FTLD. So the idea is that people who already have multiple family members with FTLD or at least one family member with FTLD can be considered as a potential subject or you can genotype this particular uh, family member for potential abnormalities that occur in these three main genes, which are MAPT, uh, which is simply referred to as tau, uh, 
GRN or progranulin, and C9 or chromosome 9 open reading frame 72, which is the most popular one. So when I was um, part of this collaboration, the, the pitch to me was in a clinical study, if you wanted to be able to come up with a clinical trial, which eventually develops a drug for, say, um, any neurodegenerative disease. In the first phase of the trial, the main thing that you should be able to establish is that the drug is not toxic. That is, at the very least, it causes no harm. Now, in the second phase of the drug, you administer it into a homogeneous sample of subjects. If you administer it to people with normal brains, or at least um, following the normal aging process, it's not as easy to see the generation. You might be following them for so long and not witness any tissue loss at all. Whereas if you follow people who are already at risk because you know they have the genetic markers, then you're more likely to see an impact or you are more likely to, to, to give them preventative measures so that they don't develop the, the severe version of the neurodegenerative disease. So it's not like we're trying to save the world, but at the very least, there is a big picture on what we are trying to study. As I have mentioned earlier, the application that I will show to you today is about uh, visual working memory, which is the imaging genetics study that I have shown a slide ago, and it's about healthy subjects. So the question really is, why are you studying healthy subjects? Well, you have to start somewhere, but the big picture and the challenge for the entire um, imaging genetics community is to be able to come up with solutions to problems such as um, FTLD. So eventually, the set of projects that I will work on will lead to this, and in the next few slides, I hope to show you the same thing. So here, okay, let's shift gears a little bit. So that's the idea that we have in terms of, of the underlying motivation of the study. Now, the big question that we can ask ourselves is, what are the statistical tools available to us to answer this problem? So one simple answer to that is penalized inference or regularized inference. So in this case, what we actually do is we try to look at, at uh, regression, but in, in terms of putting penalties to it. So however, when we're looking at genetic information as potentially our variables, most genes have very small or moderate effects. And in fact, the top genes or the significant genes only explain a small proportion of genetic heritability. So that poses some problems. Now, there are a lot of penalized regression literature available to us as of today. So it depends on the underlying assumptions, which is an important starting point before we jump into the statistics. So in our study, our assumption is that signals are believed to be dense as compared to sparse. So when signals are dense, that means that if you have a lot of genes, and you associate parameters to each of this um, variable, then there are no large parameters, but there are many small non-zero parameters. Whereas if it's sparse, most are zero and only a small proportion of them have non-zero parameters that are super large in, dimension, in, in magnitude. So in this case, um, we're trying to justify our use of the L2 or rich regularization as opposed to L1 or um, lasso, typically the lasso a way of doing regression. So that's basically the set of topics that I will present today. So I wanted to highlight um, whatever is the current research gap that we have. I also wanted to, to look into the new features of our proposed methodology, and finally, to be able to give you the proof that it indeed works via some numerical studies. So first, um, let me highlight for you the research gap. So here, in terms of the illustration, so the conventional wisdom in statistical learning is that whenever we have high dimensional models, they require strong penalties because that's the only way for us to avoid overfitting. 
So we're trying to minimize generalization error. And for us to be able to do that, we'd rather have biased models so that the variance would be reduced. However, there are some problems to, to the way we look at this. So to be able to show you that, I will give you a motivational example, which is a dummy data set that I encourage most of the uh, people doing statistics to at the very least play with. So this is the liver toxicity data set from Bushill et al. in 2007. And this is available in R from the mix o -mix package provided by Rohart in 2017. So the data is um, presented this way. So there are 64 male rats exposed to varying doses of paracetamol or acetaminophen in a given controlled experiment. So after the necropsies of this, um, these rats, after they were exposed to, to this toxic doses, then mRNA from their liver were extracted and microarray expression levels of 3,116 genes were collected. So 10 chemical uh, clinical chemistry measurements of variables containing markers for the liver and some serum measurements were available for each subject. So this can quickly be a project for uh, or even a problem set or homework for a statistics elective class in high dimensional analysis. So the data features, as I mentioned, we have 64 male rats, we have 3,116 gene expression levels and 10 clinical chemistry measurements. So statistically, the way we look at this is we not always necessarily look at what the numbers mean all the time, but we at the very least need to understand so that we can put the right notations. So for us, this means n is equal to 64. That means sample size is 64. P, which associates to the number of variables that we will use to explain the different chemistry measurements or clinical measurements is 3116 and q is arguably could be 10 could be viewed one at a time where q is the number of response variables so in this case we can do a multivariate analysis or we can do 10 univariate analysis so when we analyze this um, dummy data set it's biological of course but we need a starting point we were able to look at the results when we have um n equals 64 and p equals 50 versus the case when we have n equals 64 and p equals 3116. That is put in simplest sense, we're comparing low dimensional data and high dimensional data. That means the figure that you see on the left part is actually containing just a subset of 50 variables from more than 3,000 variables. And what do we see here on the x-axis is log of lambda, which is the penalty uh, parameter. And on the y-axis, we see the cross-validated mean square error. So mean square error is an error. So we want it to be as small as possible. And the idea is that we're looking for the value of lambda which minimizes that form of error. So it means, so in the left panel, the blue dots represents the minimum of the plot. And you can see 10 figure, 10 plots here, line plots in a way, because um, that corresponds to the curves of the 10 response variables that we have. So that's not a problem under the low dimensional case. However, if we look at the right panel, which is the high dimensional case, as you can see, most of the variables, actually exactly five of the variables out of 10, have the, the, the minimizer lambda. So the smallest error is associated to the smallest lambda provided as well. So the idea with cross-validation is that before you start the cross-validation, you have to provide the software, in this case, GLMnet, you have to provide the software of possible values of the penalty parameter for it to choose from that set of values. So, okay, I provided this range. And then specifically in that range, if we are in the high dimensional case, it picks the smallest one. So that tells me that the choice of the optimal or best lambda depends on the researcher. 
because if I give a different set of possible values of lambda, which we see on the x-axis, then potentially my minimizer would be different. So as you can see here, there are still five variables which are behaving the way we would have wanted them, similar to the left panel, but we've already seen like half of the 10 variables showing some, some sort of skepticism on the objectivity of this method. So the idea is that depending on the regularization parameter that we will use, our estimates will be affected. And if we're using those estimates to perform the test, then our test will be affected also. So that's why it's very important to pick this regularization parameter properly. So, okay, I know in most um, analysis that we perform, particularly in penalized regression, we typically think of this parameter as a nuisance parameter. That is, it's kind of annoying for us, but we have to deal with it anyway. So, however, here we're highlighting the impact of, of that, particularly under the high dimensional case. So, this is not entirely surprising. In fact, the way the literature has emerged over the last few decades, starting from the seminal work of Hurl and Kennard in 1970, is that people have been trying to propose a way to come up with this parameters, estimator for this um, penalty parameter. So how do you estimate the penalty? So there is no scarcity of literature available for this in the low dimensional case. That is when n, is greater than P. However, the main important thing that's why I'm showing this table is that, for example, when Hurl and Kennard started this in 1970, their estimator looks like sigma hat squared divided by the square of the, the estimates for beta. So beta hat transpose beta hat. Sometime later, which is around five years later, they decided to change their own proposed formula by multiplying it by P. Two years later, they instead decided to adjust the formula by Hurl et al by subtracting it by two and so on. So as you can see, um, during this time when computational resources is still not as accessible to us as it is right now, then the way that they propose um, estimators is enough for them to be able to come up with a paper. But right now, of course, this is no longer sufficient for us. So an important thing that I wanted to highlight under the low dimensional case is that most of their estimates require sigma hat squared. So sigma, even sigma hat, the estimator of sigma, and sigma represents the standard deviation of the true model. So in this case, so of course, it's a scalar multiplier. But what I'm saying is, the moment you have that quantity, it guarantees that your lambda hat are all positive. So another way that people has been doing the choice is by using cross-validation, as you've seen as well in the figures I've shown earlier. So two of the most popular cross-validation techniques are leave one out cross-validation. And in this case, the formula is um, as follows. So you can see it in equation one. So we're getting the mean. The mean of what? So it's squared quantities, squared of what? So inside what we have are supposed to be error. So this is yi, this is the observation for the i -th response variable, and the subtrahend is actually the fitted value. However, the fit here that we have does not use the IAT information. So we're using all observations n minus the IAT observation for the fit. So that's why this estimator is the rich estimate when the IAT observation is not included when you train the data because you will use that IAT observation as the test set. So our test set contains just one observation. So with some little algebra, we can re-express equation one using equation two. And I am not uh, kidding you, and I'm not 
arrogant and I'm not trying to say anything about like clearly it follows from equation one, but I can definitely talk to the experts in, in the group who are interested with the, with the calculation of this. And this can be shown algebraically where each in the denominator represents the hat matrix, which is very popular in linear models. So the idea is that instead of having the negative i, which is you're basically removing one observation at a time, little n times, here you don't have to remove anything. All you have to do is use the original data set and then divide it by some quantity. And that adjusts for the one observation that you keep removing. So technically, by doing this, this is very easy to, to put in a code without having to go through a, a loop or anything uh, computationally expensive because it's just one formula. The only thing it requires is a little bit of algebraic manipulation. Now, there is also uh, a rotation invariant version of the out of sample error press statistic, which is what we call the generalized cross validation. So here, the main difference between equation two and equation three only happens in the denominator. Instead of having the ith observation of the hat matrix, so we can just think of the H as some matrix, which is very important in linear models, and H is just a function of X, and X is the set of variables that we will use. So in my genetic example, X is the set of um, microarray gene expression levels. So here, instead of getting the iot observation, we just get the trace. That is, we're just adding the diagonal elements. And with that, we have two more formulas that we can work up with. So with this said, let me show you the results of the proposed method. So as you can see in the left panel of the figure, this is a heat map. So I won't give um, too much attention on the y-axis, but these are the 10 variables that I have mentioned earlier. And on the x-axis, you're supposed to see lambda, not log of lambda. So the green line, the green vertical line represents zero. And here, what you have on the values is that the more red it is, the higher the value in terms of magnitude, whereas the lower it is, the closer it is to zero. So this is the average of negative log 10 p-values because if we just plotted p-values, these are very small numbers. On the right panel, what we see is the same x-axis. You have lambda. Again, there's a green vertical line at zero. The y-axis are the 10 variables we're interested as our response. And then the value as legend is zero for blue, and one for red. So in this case, what we see is we're getting high power whenever we have positive lambda. That's not very surprising. What is surprising for us is that we can achieve the same level of power with negative values of lambda. So it means that depending on your metric of what to choose as optimal lambda, you can end up with a higher power. And in this case, this, this breaks the, the typical convention of just looking at the penalty parameters as positive. So in fact, uh, when the, the penalty parameter is zero, it's like you're not penalizing the model at all. So here, what does it mean if you use negative penalty? So in the testing world, what this tells us is that the results are potentially almost the same. So we can get and achieve superior results with negative um, penalty parameters as well. Now, these are the contributions of our work. <laughs> the, the idea is that usually we present our work and then if we run out of time, we rush through the important bits of the work at the end. So my goal today is to be able to tell you what the outcomes are of the work. And then if we have more time, we can go through the details, of course. So our proposed data adaptive test yields superior power while maintaining the proportion of false positives. How do we achieve this? We achieve this by first determining the set of candidate values of the ridge penalty parameter, and then we select the, ulti, the optimal ridge penalty, and eventually we'll perform the adaptive test. So 
With that said, I am now ready to discuss the methodology. So how did we achieve the output that we wanted to achieve that I've just shown you? So the theory starts with ridge regression. So whenever we're looking into the, the theory in statistics, we start with the likelihood. And uh, for the non-statisticians out there, the likelihood is very intuitive. It tells you how likely <laughs> that the sample is to, to occur in a particular, if you observe this particular data set. So, so it, it allows us to compute this quantity. And the likelihood is a starting point for many estimation procedures. So the rich penalized likelihood can be written as follows in simplest form. And the important quantity here is that we have this penalty on the last part. So this is uh, clearly um, in terms of the log likelihood. So I hope you have seen that. So it means the negative here is only because of the math involved when getting the negative, uh, the, when getting the log likelihood. Now, we're interested in performing a test. So whenever we're performing a test in regression, when we have the beta vector equal to zero, it only tells us that none, none of the variables that we're incorporating in our model can explain our response. So in the genetic example earlier, none of the 3,116 microarray expression levels can explain, say, creatinine. And then we would need to be able to have a statistic or a quantity or a number eventually associated so that we can decide whether to reject or not the hypothesis. So in this case, we're using the classical Rouse score test statistic, where this notation, the asymptote notation, means equivalent under a permutation test. So equation five is also not novel because this has been a theory for statistics for so long. Now, the score test using the penalized likelihood, as I mentioned earlier, starts with S of lambda, and we can write this as the trace of this matrix. So we can look at the diagonal elements and add them up. Now, the important thing from this quantity and the reason why I'm still showing this, despite of the potential heterogeneity in the audience, is so that we can look at it in some lens of a statistician. So this S now eventually becomes S0 and becomes S infinity. So how did that happen? So it's telling us that there is a framework using the score test. So starting from the ridge uh, penalized likelihood that you've seen earlier, if lambda is zero, then this quantity inside the parentheses reduces to x transpose x without this quantity because lambda is zero, which you can see here. And then we can simply write the trace like this. And then when lambda approaches infinity, we can rewrite this entire quantity as an even simpler version of the product of two matrices and then get the trace of that product. So the idea is that if we just start from this penalized likelihood and the output, the score test statistic from this, we don't even need to assume that it's a fixed effects model or that it's a random effects model. Our data adaptive choice of lambda will tell that for us. Because for us statisticians, before we fit the model, we typically make an assumption. We make an assumption on the type of linear model that is. And that two major assumption is whether we have fixed effects or we have random effects. So, but it, what I'm trying to say is that we don't even have to do that. Just compute the quantity above, whatever the value of lambda is, if lambda approaches zero, it tells you that it's a fixed effects model. If lambda is so high to the right, then it tells you that more or less the underlying data structure is in fact assuming a random effects linear model structure. So in that case, it minimizes the set of assumptions that we have to do by just focusing on one equation. Now, let me move a little bit from the score statistic. So the idea of the score statistic is we just want one quantity to be able to help us perform the test. 
Now, what is the test that we're performing? So we can either perform a score test or we can perform a different test, which we call Mantle test. So Mantle test is actually proposed by Nathan Mantle around the 1970s. And the simplest example he had in his paper is about the clustering of leukemia cases. What he's trying to look at is distance in space as compared to distance in time. So it, it kind of tells you that you have two different sources of data and you're trying to look at how, how clustered the cases of leukemia are for a given region at a given time point. And he is from the NIH, so he has access to data about these leukemia cases. Now, mantle test is more likely used in ecology. So an example of this is estimates of genetic distance versus estimates of geographical distances between the ranges of each species to other species. So the hypothesis in ecology, at least, is that the variation in genetics is correlated or associated to the variation in geographical distance. So in other words, we can look at two different types of data set and look at similarity information between them by looking at their dependent structure. So we're studying the dependent structure of like genetic distances versus geographical distances. And you kind of think genetic distances, how do you measure that? What do you mean by similar? And then geographical distances, what do you mean by similar? And then you, you summarize that and then you pull them together. Are the two data related to one another? So the statistic that is used by Mantle for him to perform the tests is something familiar already that we've seen a slide ago, which is the trace of the product of two matrices where H and K here are gram matrices associated to a given kernel. So not to steal the thunder from, or to be anticlimactic about this, the kernel that we will use is what we call the ridge kernel so as to tie everything up. So the result that we have uh, by implementing singular value decomposition on our um, matrix of explanatory variables x can be rewritten using this quantity. So we just need this quantity because the simplest sense that you will keep seeing from this point forward is this summation. So if r is the rank of the matrix, then we're just taking the sum from one to small r of this ratio, dj squared divided by dj squared plus lambda times zj squared. And this is asymptotically a mixture of chi-square random variables, of course, chi-square one random variables. Now, the important thing to look at here is that if lambda is zero, this entire ratio reduces to one. With me, which means that we are under the fixed effects model. If lambda goes to infinity, we can just simplify this in terms of summation in terms of uh, some function of zj squared as well. So lambda here can take some number. But if we yes, use the conventional wisdom that lambda is supposed to be positive, then this quantity is positive dj squared is a square, so it's positive. So if you add lambda to be positive, then this ratio is a number from 0 to 1. So it's providing us with some form of shrinkage. However, if we let lambda to be negative, this is actually not providing us with the shrinkage, but actually with the boost, because this will be higher than 1, provided that, of course, lambda is not greater than dj squared. Otherwise, this quantity becomes negative, and chi-square by nature cannot be negative. So the important link is that we don't need to set the model, whatever assumption we have on that. We just let the data tell us what the structure is. So that's a good thing because it frees us statistician from having to validate so many assumptions. Now, the main link to mantle test, and this is where the mantle test and the score test meet, meets each other, is that the form of the score test statistic can be written as a mantle test statistic. And then we can just use this to perform the test. So with this said, we now have this particular um, proposed algorithm. So I know this is a little um, 
tedious to look at. So that's why I will go through the procedure step by step. So the first step is to select the choice of candidate values. So you need to be able to identify the interval where you can choose from. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, if you only allow yourself positive values and it just chooses the smallest among the positive values that you choose, then one analyst with another analyst can have two different um, data interpretations because they have two different data analysis. So in this case, as I mentioned earlier, we will be using this score test and I have already highlighted that this is also a form of bundle test. So from this test, these DJs are actually what we call singular value, whereas the square are what we call the eigenvalues. So the singular values are what we will use to be able to identify the range. So as I mentioned, we will let the data decide about the range. So we look into the data, we decompose the data, we look at the singular values, and then we specify some threshold, say um, a quantile. So a typical choice of this will have to be the median, and that's what Peter Bullman likes. But for us, we have categorized this into several other possible quantiles. So what it means is whenever you have a very big matrix, typically the singular values, while they are not <laughs> going to be negative and they are they they will approach very very close to zero so if you just use the smallest singular value without thresholding it will end up having just an interval purely positive values so that's why we have to put an adjustment or a thresholding so we threshold it based on the quantiles of this singular value so for instance we look at the at tau equals zero, it means you did not perform any thresholding because this will always be true. When tau is um, the, the, the median, then you just pick, you just adjust the singular values to be the, the original provided they are higher than the median, but otherwise you set them to zero. Now we pick L min to be the smallest um, positive adjusted singular value. And then we compute the minimum lambda to be this quantity multiplied by L mean. So as you can see, lambda by nature is negative because this is negative of some quantity squared and then L mean is bound to be positive. So however, this could be a, a starting point could be from negative 0.5 to say positive infinity or could be from negative 5 to positive infinity, depending on the adjustment that is performed in step one. Now, of course, that's an assumption. It means we will have to test whether the thresholding procedure makes sense. So this is how we perform the algorithm. So we have capital B permutations. So B equals zero here represents the original data set. And then we permute the data set capital B times. So in our simulations, capital B is 1,000 to 10,000, depending on the, on the um, assumptions that we have. Now, suppose these are the possible values of lambda that we have from our step one. So lambda one is the smallest, and then lambda m is the maximum. Lambda m can be specified in the software as infinity, i and f in R, or it could be a very, very large number, say 10 to the 9. And then we pick from each data set, so we have B permutations and then the original data set, we pick the optimal lambda via cross-validation, either using LOOCB or GCB. Then we plug in the optimal lambda to the test statistic. As I told you earlier, the test statistic, which will tell us whether we should reject or not the null hypothesis is a function of lambda. So our choice of lambda will affect the test statistic and thereby the decision. So we plug that in. And then we perform some standardization for a fixed lambda. So we look into all um, uh, test statistics within the fixed lambda to be able to get some quantity P sub zero. And the reason for standardizing is because the permuted data set could have very different magnitudes. So we just want all of them to be a number from zero to one. So we have a comparison between all of them within the same fixed lambda. Now we do that same thing for the first permuted data. We did it from the original data before for the permuted data until the last permuted data. And then we will end up with a p-value. 
So our p-value is just the proportion of cases among b plus 1 where pb is less than or equal to the original p sub 0. So the idea with this is that the complexity is linear in terms of b and m. And b is the number of permutations, m is the number of lambdas we are considering. So in my case, I'm considering 10,000 values of lambda or 1,000 depending on the, on the value of lambda min. Now, there's a trick, another algebraic trick to reduce the computational cost when we are in the high dimensional case. And instead of inverting a P by P matrix when P is very large, we end up inverting an N by N matrix and we reduce the comp computational complexity by a lot. So which is a function of capital B and capital M. Now, we also proposed another thing. As I mentioned earlier, the asymptotic distribution of our score statistic is a distribution which is a mixture of chi-square random variables. So chi-square technically falls under the family of gamma distribution. So in this case, we're using the gamma approximation as our null distribution. We will compute the parameters of the gamma distribution in this step using method of moments. So this is the part that I am mixing statistical inference all over the place because this is testing. You have to be able to utilize as many tools that you have in your bag of tricks. Now, this is the part where I show you that the method works. Of course, this is kind of anticlimactic because we don't get at this part without having outcomes that work. So we should expect that this numerical study should be in favor of what we wanted. So the first thing we have to show is that our type 1 error is controlled. So we have multiple covariance structures. I just reduced the outputs I will show you into two because these are the only tables that will fit the slides. And I don't want to use a very small font to show you the numbers. Otherwise, it's practically meaningless. We have multiple values of P and we have different thresholding. We included the cases that we did not have a threshold. So that is tau is set to zero. And then we use the first quartile or the second quartile, which is also known as the median. And the first quartile is also known as the 25th percentile. Now we have two tests to consider when we're just using algorithm one, which is with cross validation. And the second algorithm, whenever we have both gamma approximation and cross validation. As you can see in all of these cases, the type one error is controlled at 5%, which is good. Even if we have the simplest covariance structure or a heteroscedastic covariance structure, which is um, the variabilities are much more non-uniform or not the same, different in a way. So in another thing that we looked into is the power, sorry. In this case, we also have the, the power. And for the power, what we have is very low for the first part. That is the case when P is equal to 500. But when P is high dimensional and that's 1000, we actually get uh, a good power. Okay, I forgot to mention that the sample size in all of this is 350 because we have 350 subjects in the real data set. So P is equal to 500 is more or less the same as 350. So we are experiencing problems when N is very close to P. However, when N and P are very different from each other, and in fact, very high dimensional, such as the real case of our data set, we are actually in good place. So both the, both the GA, so gamma approximation with cross-validation and without gamma approximation gives us good results. But in terms of magnitude, the gamma approximation helps a little bit. So finally, I will discuss the application. So the application is a visual um, memory working experiment, a visual working memory experiment. So in this case, what we have is you get to look at a blank screen like this, and then you, you look at that for say 500 milliseconds, and then you look at the sample array. Now that's the, that's the array that you have to remember. And then it's like the memory array. And then you will be asked to look at um, blank screen. 
and then you will be asked to look at the test array. So the question is very simple, are they the same or not? So in this very simple example, everything is the same except for the orange turning purple or violet. So in this case, the answer is they are different. But the real experiment that was performed on BNU students is like this. So as I have said earlier, the experimental procedure is as follows, fixation, which is you just look at a black screen, you look at the, the plus, you're required to look at the plus and you're required to blink, just so your eyes does not have the, the artifact of being tired. Now there's a little error on top. That little arrow is supposed to tell you to look to the right, because that's where potentially the change will, will happen. So because it's too much to look at both left and right. So this is the standard array. You look at it for 100 milliseconds. And then the maintenance array or the rest array for almost one, one second. And then you go to the comparison array. Now, now the question is, is this and this the same? So if it were colors, they're so much easier to see, but these are both red and blue lines. So it's a little more complicated. Now, the true type of slides that were shown to them are any of the six. There are um, cases when you have two targets and two distractors, you just have two targets, you have three, four, six, and eight targets. And imagine the moment you are at the eight target, it's getting much more difficult to figure out whether um, the right and then the next test array is really the same as the previous test array. So it looks very simple as an experiment and it's only administered on healthy subjects as I mentioned earlier, but it is a very good starting point to look at this. So as I mentioned, eventually memory is very important for all of us, for independent living. If we kept forgetting things, that will have a very huge impact on our quality of life. So memory is one of those fascinating things that we have to understand as human beings. And for so many times, so, so long of like history, neuroscientists have been trying to understand the regions in our brain, which are particularly working in this part of cognition and learning. So in our case, we're including genetic information even because SNPs or genetic aberrations can potentially have an impact in our brain. And in fact, that's what we have. So these are the top um, bands. So most of the bands that we find to be significant are in the delta, alpha, and gamma band. And I'm just showing you the top results. So this particular channels probably does not mean a lot, but this means frontal, frontal part of the brain and then temporal. And this is in the central, frontal, frontal, occipital, frontal, frontal, and parietal, parietal part of the brain. And in case um, we are looking at this, these are the p-values associated from them by using the, the proposed test that we have. And these are backed up by literature. So existing literature tells us that delta band oscillations play a key role in integrative brain activity, supporting higher cognition and abnormal event-related oscillations are actually associated with cognitive deficits. So by looking at this, we're kind of answering do people with similar genetic information tend to have similar brain imaging information? And it depends on the specific band and the specific channel that we're looking into. But we were also able to detect the genetic markers associated with the significant brain channels. And that's our starting point for the next part of our research. So as a summary, Ridge is a bridge. So Ridge actually bridges both linear fixed effects and random effects methods. And Ridge penalty parameters in our proposed method is data adaptive. We just let the data pick what value it wants via cross-validation. And as I've shown you, the cross-validation technique that we have doesn't really have to split the data into folds. So it's not computationally expensive. And we even have a magical trick to make things even better in terms of computational complexity. My R codes are available via GitHub and the paper is also available if you wanted a copy for the details. But more importantly, we have shown evidence in favor of the proposed thresholding 
procedure. And we can show that the optimal ridge penalty can in fact be negative, whereas GCB and LOOCB have more or less similar performance in testing. Let me highlight that cross-validation techniques are used for predictive performance. And using it as a testing procedure is not very much conventional because we use it for predictive abilities not in terms of as as a as a metric that is very close to the test statistic now finally our proposed method can give us superior power while controlling the false discoveries or false positives now what about future work there's a lot of them but i will just highlight that the new data set that we have right now is no longer just about genetic and brain information. There's also behavioral information, and that's what we call mediation analysis. As I've just mentioned, CV or cross-validation, we're trying to investigate its asymptotic properties right now as a potential test statistic and not just to be used for predictions. And finally, you've seen earlier that there is a problem when N is approximately P. So we're trying to use the concept of knockoffs as data augmentation procedure, because if it's high dimensional, we get very good results. So why not just make it high dimensional? And then of course, there's so much more possible researches to, to deal with, but these are my highlights. Some references, as I've mentioned, we already have a paper in Frontiers in Neuroscience. It's accessible. People who wanted a copy, I can just send you a copy. And finally, thank you for your attention, and I'm wishing you a very fruitful second half of 2022. Let me be the first to greet you. Happy 2023, because the remaining part of the year will just pass by really fast. So thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Iris, for the very exciting work that uh, you are doing, uh, uh, trying to uh, use uh, penalization, penalized uh, inference in analyzing uh, data coming from different sources. And as you mentioned, not just two, uh, perhaps three or more data sources, put them together, integrate them into your uh, analysis data, they become very high dimensional. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, many uh, of the participant audience here will get uh, uh, stimulus from your uh, work. I think we can entertain uh, a few questions. Iris can entertain a few questions. So uh, if you have uh, some, some questions, you can use uh, the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. Pwede rin akong magtawag. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, okay, <laughs> glad this. Yes, thank you very much, Iris, for that um, comprehensive um, presentation. So, although it's um, very, um, for me, it was all math, <laughs> all those equations, but you mentioned that you're, you use this in, uh, the application for this is in the imaging of um the brain, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So um, in this method that you're using, you can also apply it. I'm assuming you can also apply it in other diseases, right? As an application. Oh. When, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh. And, and then um, do you need a very powerful computer to do all those calculations that you showed? Ah, okay. So the, the difficulty technically comes from data pre-processing. So whenever you have whenever you have the EEG latched into your head and you have all the signals, you have to translate the signals into numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we are practically standing on the shoulder of giants because we receive the clean form of the data. So not entirely clean, but some pre-processed version of the data. 
we receive it to be a very, very large data set that is not easily shareable. But nonetheless, the artifacts were removed or the noise were removed by the neuroscientists involved. So however, um, the answer to the first question is, um, this is highly about imaging genetics. So our, our focus is on um, diseases that pertain to the brain, such as those diseases about We've been studying ADHD a lot and epilepsy a lot as well. But personally, I'm more interested about, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really attracted to diseases that we detect at the very late stage already. And then by then it's too late. So mm -hmm. that's the same with cancer. That's the same with any form of dementia or, or ALS or or Alzheimer's. So that's why I'm, I'm attracted to that. But of course, it can be applied to, to other diseases as well. In terms of the, the data, data, as you said, it's huge. Um, computationally, if you have narrowed down the cleaning and you're done with that, you can run the code in your own computer. Like the only thing it took us, it required us for a high performance computing facility is to perform the simulations. But the analysis itself, you can do that in less than 10 minutes if you already have the test solid. So you just input it into a function, it churns something out and then it goes out as a p-value and you have a result. So in po. Thank you for that simplified answer. <laughs> may, may, may I add uh, that uh, actually uh, that's one uh, big challenge in uh, uh, in data science uh, in analyzing big data these days. Uh, the pre-processing part, uh, 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 trying to uh, make make sure to uh, to uh, sh shape off shape off the data to, so that it will be in a format that will be usable in whatever analysis you will do is the more challenging part. But the moment that you have already uh, formatted the data, uh, analysis will be much uh, simplified. And that's uh, uh, exactly what uh, many people are doing. Uh, some of our students here are actually uh, going into that. Uh, making uh, the pre-processing part uh, uh, simplified a little bit more so that uh, computing time will be uh, minimized. Okay, any other questions, clarifications? If none, maybe we it's time for us to uh, Give a round of applause to Iris for, for the very uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, maybe Gladys have some announcement on future webinars, fire chat. Oh, yes, we have another. Um, um, actually, for this month, that, that's this is the last uh, presentation, but we will have another one next. Uh, week July 8th it's a uh, fireside chat is more on uh, mentoring it's with a um, organization um, it's with grad map and perhaps I'm not sure if um, if uh, Mario is here so we are um, actually um, this is a joint activity with um, another organization that is which is called Grand. Yeah, I am here. Uh, hi, Mario. Hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> I can just show you. It's early morning here, but then yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, next week uh, on July eighth, eight a.m. in the Philippines, we'll be holding the fireside chat on mentoring. You know, the next generation of Filipino scientists and engineers. Co-sponsored by the Grad Map Philippines and uh, Paase, uh, we have three speakers from Grad Map. Uh, currently, uh, doctoral students uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and one uh, from Australia, and another one in Europe. And then we have reactors. Dr. Francis de los Reyes from uh, North Northern. Uh, uh, Carolina State University and Dr. Menchi Ablan Lagman from De La Salle University. So thank you.
Thank you, Iris. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barrios. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you. Yes. We have yes. here with us uh, two uh, presidents of Paasi, the current and the former president of Paasi, uh, Dr. Yes, Concepcion. is here. Oh, we have, yes, we have Dr. Concepcion here. I have a follow-up question. Sorry, I just remembered. Usually, Mario asked this question, so I just want to ask, um, will you be able to apply what you're doing right now if you come, go back to the Philippines and you start your own research group? Um, will you be able to do this here? Um, the answer po is uh, what Dr. Barris and I discussed two years ago during the pandemic. We were <laughs> trying to like have a vision of where the Philippines will need statistical methodologies five years, 10 years from now. And we're projecting into the future. And um, guidance po ni Sir Niel sa akin is to go in neuroimaging. So I would answer yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the idea po is to, to be able to be ahead because right now, if you're just trying to develop tools for the current problems that we have right now, then you're already too late. So that's why our discussion then, as I remember, sir, was about where do we need statistics in the future? So we have to think ahead and like build training and expertise ahead of time. So, so yes, po. Ang haba lang ng sagot, pero yes. <laughs> you know. That's good. So can we have a, a, a can you please um, open your videos when we have a photo before we, we end Been this? Here. <laughs> so thank you very much Iris thank you for, for the invite thank you sir thank you very much so wala wala magpapakita ng mukha katayong tatlo lang <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> hey, Mario. Uh, but mom Giselle any comments or any uh, questions mom Giselle Maybe okay. she's unavailable to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, anim na tayo. So, any more? And dami, thank you. And dami nating audience ngayon, but they're very shy. Maybe okay. Mara, Joan. Ayan. <laughs> students, we, Dom. Sir, did you require your students to attend? And dami nating <laughs> attend this. Eh? Well, maybe one to open your... But there you go. <laughs> Ayan, dumami na. Kailang magtawag. <laughs> <You'll see. laughs> All right, smile. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Siya yung nawala. <laughs> Ako ba nawala? Hindi. Okay yun. Okay. okay. Wait, I'll use my phone. Ganun eh. One more. Okay. Smile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir, Ernel, for hosting po. Thank you. Sa susunod. Okay, sa susunod. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please uh, don't forget uh, uh, APAMS 2022. Yeah. Yes. yes. You can present again. Yes, I will. Your, I will, I will email you. <laughs> The 42nd April. Thank you all. All right. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.